came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And so they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, In all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent." And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as they sat at the table with them, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the Scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, this is the eleven saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubt? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still 
did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he did eat it, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in, the, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful story. And, and this is really kind of over a time, a time span. We know the ascension was uh, 40 days after Christ rose from the dead. But the beautiful scripture of Jesus being ris- risen from the dead. And you have to think of this, as I mentioned earlier, as breaking news. That early Sunday morning as they were heading out, these women, and they had their spices with them, it was quite disturbing to them. And if you read other passages, they were discussing, how, what are we going to do about that stone? That stone's going to be in the way. And they get there, and they, they discover the stone's already gone. And so there's this disturbing factor. They didn't find his body. They were greatly perplexed, and they were afraid. And then they step inside, they look, and it just... It just it boggles their mind. Okay, so Jesus isn't here. There, there's some clothes lying here. The stone is away, but where's Jesus? And, and if, I don't think at this point, resurrection was in their mind. At this point, there was something else. But, but why would somebody come and steal a naked body and leave the clothes here? That doesn't make sense either. And so they were just really perplexed. And then these two men, Luke writes it as a historian. He tells the story. There's these two men, and they realize that these are angels at some point. They're afraid of them, and yet these two men tell them, why are you looking or seeking for the living among the dead? Now, I'm sure these ladies weren't thinking, well, we're not looking for the living. We're looking for a dead among the dead, because Jesus is dead. We're looking for him. And another passage, we know how Jesus, how how Mary speaks to the gardener and says, if you've taken him, well, she thought it was the gardener, if you've taken him, tell me where so I can take him away. They were fully still expecting that Jesus must be dead somewhere. But these men, these angels said, why are you seeking for the living? And then they helped them remember. Do you remember? He said that he would rise again on the third day. He would be crucified, he would die, and he would rise again. And then they remembered, but I don't know that they really understood. As they went back, they hurried back to the eleven and all the rest of the disciples, and these ladies began to tell them. Now, there's plenty of people today that would like to tell you that as a historical book, if you go to a secular college and you study religion, that that this is what the the disciples perceived or that there was a maybe a spiritual sense that Jesus was there, that it didn't really happen. But if you think about all the pieces that came together, if Luke had been trying to write it in such a way that it just seemed like it happened, why would he have started with these pieces? Now, in this time, women were not really expected to know as much. They, they weren't esteemed equal with men. Why would a historian write that the women came first and told this story? There's proof number one. And the stories don't all equally match up. 
And here, the first proof was that these women came and told it. If they wanted to have credibility that there was not a real risen Christ, they would have had some educated men come and say this first, but it wasn't. It was the women who came and told this, and they believed it. And then Jesus appeared to Simon Peter, and he believed, and these women believed. I'd like us to turn to John chapter 20, just for a comparison of one little piece. John 20, verse 11. In John, the story unfolds a little bit differently. The women come to the tomb, and then the women leave, but Mary stays behind. And so here is Mary, verse 11 of John 20. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And we'll, we'll stop reading there. Mary recognized the voice of Jesus calling her name. And who was this person? Mary truly loved Jesus. But Mary had come from really, really rough places. She had seven demons cast out of her. She had walked closely with the Lord. The Lord had truly transformed her life, and she was living a different life than she had known before. She really loved the Lord, and here she was weeping. This was her, her new master, and yet he was gone, and she didn't know what to make of all this. And she heard Jesus calling her name, and she recognized it. It was the voice of the master she loved. And when the disciples heard all this, they just thought it was nonsense talk. It didn't make any sense to them. As we look at the road to Emmaus and uh, Cleopas and his partner, whoever that was, maybe it was his wife, maybe they were heading back to their own town, to their home, maybe it was another disciple, we don't know for sure who it was, but as they were walking, they were doing the same thing that you and I do when we have some breaking news that we don't know what to make of. We have a little piece of information, and it comes out, and you know how news usually trickles out, and then a little bit later, somebody hears a little more information, it gets passed along, and it gets trickled, and they're walking along at seven miles, maybe an hour and a half of a good pace of walking, and they're discussing, they're conversing and reasoning what could have happened to Jesus. They're still in confusion. They don't understand at this point what's going on. And Jesus comes along, and he meets them, and he just says, what are you talking about? And it's very obvious, God held back their sight so that they could not fully recognize Jesus. And Jesus kind of plays along with this thing, and he says, like, well, well what things? And because they wanted to know, are you the only stranger? Well, truly, Jesus was the only one who really knew what was going on. And he just says, what things? Well, these things about Jesus of Nazareth. And so there's a true story. There's a story that's been rippling through Israel around and around about this Jesus of Nazareth. And he's a mighty prophet. That's one of the things they said about him. They said that he's mighty indeed. He's doing things that man has never done before. And he's mighty in word. He had authority when he spoke to them before God and the people. They recognized that this person really, really was from God in some way, although maybe their understanding was limited. And they say, our own chief priests and leaders have crucified this person. And they said, but we were hoping that this was He who was going to redeem Israel. Only a little bit later, they would change that sentence and say, 
But we realize, not hope, that it was He who did redeem Israel through His suffering. He had to come through suffering in order to bring redemption for Israel. But this redemption that they were looking for, they were expecting a new exodus, an exodus from Egypt, an exodus from the Roman power. They wanted to be delivered and redeemed again. But Jesus was crucified, and that was devastating because now the pagans had killed their Messiah or their Redeemer, and they didn't realize that Jesus' suffering, that Jesus' very death on the cross was the key to Him bringing redemption. This was how He was going to redeem Israel. Still not fully convinced, and yet they're listening to Jesus expounding through Scripture what Scriptures were all about. And all these years, yes, they knew that Scriptures pointed them to the Messiah, but they didn't realize that it was pointing them to Christ, the person they knew who had walked with them. And He says to them, O foolish ones. Now, not thinking in in this era, in this context, not thinking of simple ones or those who know very little, foolish actually had kind of a heavy meaning. Remember the other Scripture where it says, don't call somebody a fool, or the fool says within his own heart, there is no God. Here, they were called fools because they didn't believe. There was a moral sense where they were not believing what they should be believing. And they thought Christ would be delivered, I mean, Israel would be delivered. And He says, don't you believe the Scriptures? Ought not the Messiah, Christ, to have suffered these things and to enter into glory? Christ entering into the glory as a human who has lived on earth, fully God, going back to glory. And when His transformed body came back, it was different than when Lazarus was raised from the dead. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, he was given another mortal body. He had to die again at some point. But Jesus, he was flesh and bones. He came back as a living being. They could touch him. And when you felt his arm, you could feel a real substance. And then when he wanted to leave, he had this other dimension and he could go through the wall. He could go right into glory. He'd go to heaven. Our promise is that you and I will someday have this same transformed body. We will be given a body that will no longer be bound to only flesh and and bones bound to the earthly dimensions. This resurrection story is truly, truly amazing. We have Jesus promising that when He was resurrected, He began to make all things new again. And that work has begun in you today and has begun in us already. He's already making all things new. And His body was new. When they first broke bread together, when Jesus had that first meal, think back with me that first time the first two people ate a meal together. That was recorded in Scripture. Adam and Eve ate of the tree. And guess what happened? Their eyes were opened and they discovered, they discovered their nakedness. Brokenness, decay, and sorrow is all traced back to that rebellion. And see what's happening here. Jesus' first meal with two people and their eyes are open to see that this risen Lord is coming back. He is bringing new hope for us. He is changing that part of death. Death is broken, right? And life and joy and new possibilities are present with us. Jesus brought to them a brand new picture, and they had to go tell it. As soon as Jesus vanished, they had come home. They said, Jesus, it's too late for you to go on. Come stay with us. But when they found this news, It didn't matter how late in the afternoon or evening it was. 
they hiked down the road probably faster than they had walked earlier and went back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. And when they get there, they discover Jesus has already met with Simon too. And they said, the Lord is risen indeed. And then they told them how Jesus had broken bread with them and they had re- been re- Jesus had been revealed to them. Their eyes were opened and their hearts burned with the story of Jesus. Let me ask you something. When you read the Scriptures and you, you, you see the story that God has put together, that all the way through, does the Scripture make your heart burn? That Jesus is alive. Jesus is the hero all the way through the Old Testament story. He's being foretold, and Jesus is present. Let me ask you another question. Have your eyes been opened? Did you sit and eat bread with Jesus, and did your eyes open to see that this is the real Messiah? This is the one that will redeem us, and He has already begun redeeming us if we've believed in Him. And just beautiful what Jesus says to them, verse 36, as Jesus comes into their midst right there, Cleopas and his partner and the eleven and other disciples, they're gathered together, they're telling this little thing, and Simon, so he's having to retell his part, and Jesus just comes right into their midst. They're shocked, they're terrified, but Jesus says, peace be with you. Have you heard the words, peace be with you in your own heart? Has Jesus spoken that message to you? Do you know deep in your heart that there is peace in the midst of trouble and turmoil? This was not just a spirit or a ghost. This was the real Jesus risen. And then he expounded to them the Scriptures, and they began to see Christ in a new way, hidden in the Old Testament Scriptures, so that they would comprehend the Scriptures. And Jesus tells them why this had to happen. 46, verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in the name of Jesus to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses. And each of you, if you've heard Jesus' voice, He's called you by name. If He's spoken peace to you, and if you've accepted this, repen- this remission of sins through repentance, He is saying to you, you are His witness. And finally, my question to you is, have you waited until you were endued with power from on high? Have you listened to the Lord? Have you waited in prayer? Have you allowed the Spirit to baptize you through and through so that all of you is surrendered. You're not holding anything back, and you're allowing His power to fill you. What will that power do in your life? That power will give us victory over sin and death, the brokenness in this world, and we will truly be connected to Christ. We will see Him, and just like in the end of the chapter, when they saw Christ rising, it wasn't a sad departure because they knew the true story and they worshiped Him and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Have you worshiped Jesus? Have you surrendered everything to Him and given all worth and praise to Him? Did you open your mouth and did you worship Him? Today we have this beautiful opportunity to gather as believers and rejoice in Christ being present here, Christ being risen indeed. And as we take of that bread, may it be like Cleopas and his partner, as they broke bread, may our eyes be opened and may we realize that Christ is truly right here with us and we're breaking bread and we're partaking of Jesus Christ and He is in us He is in our midst, and He works through us. The risen Messiah is here with us today. Let us worship with Him. I'm asking for a song uh, as a closing for this part of the service. Mr. Kimmerer.